Great. I'm Matt Norman. I'm in the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, and I'm going to talk about C++ performance portability for domain scientists and Fortran developers. And before I start the talk, um, a lot of books are titled things like this, and, and they might as well say for dummies, um, the way we read them anyway. I assure you I don't mean it that way, because if I did mean for dummies, I would be talking about myself. I'm only about two years new in C++, so rest assured, um, this is not meant that way. Um, so just some acknowledgments, this uses uh, OLCF resources, and this is uh, partially funded by the Exascale Computing Project from DOE. So what is portable C++? We'll go ahead and jump right in there. I feel like there's a lot of potential confusion um, around what exactly it is. It is just a library. It is not a separate language. It's not a language extension. You can compile it with uh, G++ exactly as it is or Clang, whichever your flavor is. It's based on what's called a kernel paradigm. So this is something used by CUDA and HIP and probably some others as well. The kernel is a, set, is a bit of code that performs work on a single thread. And then you let the launcher of that kernel know how many threads there are. And it requires no more work or information than you're already used to providing. So the loops you see here in green are providing the threading. And you can see some open ACC directives up here where you collapse this into a single level. And the kernel body is the code itself inside. Uh, the kernel is the loop body that you see here. So there's nothing new here. A kernel is just the body of the loop and the threads are just the, the do loops. And the core of portable C++ is the ability to cast code as an object in the language, an object that you can pass. So C++ has this neat thing called a lambda. You don't need a lambda. There is something called a functor that you could create, but lambdas are more convenient where basically the C++ language will convert the code inside the Lambda into a class object for you. And then you just pass that bit of code around to whatever launcher you want, and it can launch it with CUDA, HIP, OpenMP offload, or whatever you want, even OpenACC. It is just as flexible and generic as directives are. It just has an odd syntax for a Fortran program. So in this example you see here, you have a set of loops these are encapsulated by this bounds class that you see here. And then you launch the Lambda and it inserts the thread into each of these indices for you. And most of the C++ portability frameworks have what are called these uh, multidimensional array classes that can look and feel like Fortran if you want them to. And you're probably wondering what exactly is YACL, stands for yet another kernel launcher. And this is a C++ portability framework I've developed and you might ask the question, why develop yet another portable C++ library? Um, and it is certainly not meant to compete with the larger frameworks, uh, ones like Cocos or Sickle or Raja. It was created because we needed early access to AMD hardware and we needed a, a quick, easy solution. So YAKL is only about 6,000 lines of code. It's very easy to add a new hardware back in if you want. It doesn't have a lot of needs like the larger frameworks do. Uh, we only use a single level of parallelism. It's pretty simple. And the focus early was on Fortran-like behavior because we had to port Fortran codes over to C++. You heard a talk earlier from Isaac Lingos porting the SAM code, System for Atmospheric Modeling. The Fortran code was in development while he was doing that. So unfortunately, he had to permute all the indices and he had to change all of the one lower bounds and, and arbitrary lower bounds to zero. It was really a headache. So um, I developed the Fortran-like behavior to make that headache go away and to make the process easier in the future. So it's really just a quick stopgap, an easy code. And the, the hope is eventually to merge into Cocos or to wrap around Cocos. So why portable C++ in the first place? It's a good question. C++, again, can conveniently describe any section of code as an object that you can pass around to whatever launcher you want. Fortran does not have the capability at this time. But even if Fortran did have the capability, C is always the first language that a vendor develops their implementation in. So this is critical for efforts that have to perform on day one for new architectures. I'm part of um, the ECP early access to Frontier and Aurora. 
And our code that we're developing, it's really important to DOE and for our science that we create a code that can work on day one. Fortran has been known to lag C by five years or more and robust implementation and emphasis is on robust. So have an implementation, but it tends to be buggy sometimes. And there are some languages like HIP and Sickle that will never have a Fortran implementation. C is always the more reliable implementation. And, and I think the only reason for this is Fortran is simply less popular and there are fewer people working on it than there are working on C. There's a lot of uh, fuzziness into what the implementation will actually do in the uh, Fortran standard. And the directives-based standard interacting with modern Fortran constructs is even fuzzier. Oftentimes the, the standards are completely silent on what should happen in a certain case. C++ classes, on the other hand, are much better defined as how they are implemented by the standard, and it makes it easier for vendors to handle them. Although it's not entirely easy, there are some gotchas you got to be aware of. Other advantages of portable C++ compared to Fortran, in my experience, is when you're debugging, the Fortran array metadata can actually change in the subroutine interface. We all know this. We've all probably used this. The problem is it's not safe. If you do that, the array bounds checking can never fully be trusted because the Fortran array checking trusts what you've done and believes you. And if you resized or redimension your arrays wrongly, uh, the array bounds checking will not actually work. In C++, however, you're not allowed to do this. It is less convenient in some circumstances, but the array metadata is always tied to the object and it never changes. So when you do index checking in C++ array classes, it is far more reliable than Fortran for that reason. Plus, C++ exception throwing makes uh, tracing through the stack more easy. When you use tools like GDB, I've had cases where the Fortran compiler uh, screws things up, but I've never had a case where I was unable to track where the exception occurred in C++ code. C++ compilers also inline code much better than Fortran compilers do natively. Fortran compilers can, but you typically have to, you know, bend around backwards to get it to actually do it. And rarely, if ever, do you need an equivalent to these ACC routine or OMP declare target directives in C++ because it's typically inline. And simple C++ templating can significantly reduce your code duplication. We've all seen Fortran codes where you have this interface block that applies the routine to different numbers of dimensions and different uh, types of variables. You can get around that pretty easily with templating in C++. That said, if you use templating too much with too many abstractions, it becomes unwieldy and you can't even find the code you're looking for. Now, what are the challenges with portable C++? Vectorization is difficult. C++ has less information than Fortran. The pointers that you use are typically unsafe. And even if you put the restrict keyword, oftentimes the compiler will ignore it. And it's unclear what compilers do, what optimizations based on it. And the restrict keyword is not a part of the standard. You have to use compiler specific features for that, which gets hairy. Um, you have to stay away from non-portable features of C++, which to be honest is most of the C++ standard. You cannot use standard colon colon in most cases um, unless it's compile time because it's either invalid on the device or it's not portable to multiple hardware backends and compilers. Um, you can't use virtual functions in class inheritance because it's difficult to handle those on GPUs. Um, unfortunately, those have made their way into Fortran too, which makes it a complete nightmare in Fortran. Um, it is handleable in C++ though. Um, it's just not necessarily portable. Unified shared memory will help with a lot of these things, but it rarely performs well compared to moving your own memory. And portability is always an issue because one compiler might allow this and another compiler might not. Also, C++ lambdas, those convenient things we use in the language that cast the code as an object, they behave oddly. They only capture data from the local scope. They don't capture data from the global scope or the internal class data. And I say more on this later, I didn't actually have time to put it into the presentation, but this leads to some strange things where you have to create local references so that it appears local in the scope. Um, you can look at the YACL documentation and it gives a clear description of what that is and what it looks like. And it requires a rewrite of Fortran code, which admit, you know, we have to admit it's not easy. 
but it significantly reduces the burden of this with a tool like Yakul. And Cocos is developing a Fortran-like behavior currently as well. So if you use one of these tools that has Fortran-like behavior, it makes the porting a lot easier because the actual kernel code looks no different than the loop code in the end. So what is yet another kernel launcher? Again, it's just a 6,000 line of code, simple approach to C++ portability. It's patterned after Cocos' syntax, and it only has one level of parallelism. I would argue that if you're using two levels of parallelism, you're already making statements about the size of the inner loop, and you're sacrificing some measure of portability. It may be perfectly fine for your application, but in general, it may not be the best choice for full portability across our, our, all architectures. And it only supports two memory spaces, host and device. There's not a lot of these uh, fast and useful constant memory, textured memory that you can get from the more um, developed tools. It allows, again, Fortran-like behaviors in multidimensional arrays. You have one based indexing, but that can be arbitrary. You can change it. It's column major ordering. It's basic slicing for contiguous slices. And there's even a limited library of Fortran intrinsics. So if you want a reduction of an array, you just simply do sum or min or max, and it does the reduction for you on the device efficiently. It interacts with Fortran well. It has the ability to wrap existing Fortran allocations with unowned arrays. Cocos can do this too. It has a pool allocator that's tuned to the sorts of allocation patterns we have in weather and climate, and I'll get more on that later. The pool allocator uses CUDA managed memory if you want. It has Fortran hooks. And what this does is it enables an incremental path for porting a large Fortran code base to C++. There are convenient NetCDF, FFT, random number generator utilities for the Apple arrays as well. So the multidimensional array classes, the syntax will look kind of strange for a Fortran programmer, which you can see here in the typedef. Um, the reason we use typedef here is so that all you have to see in your code is this real 1D, real 2D, or you could have integer 1D, or logical 1D if you want to use pools. So we can typedef these to make them more clear, and we can use this using statement so they don't have to have these uh, namespace colon colons which a lot of Fortran programmers may not be familiar with. So you can hide those in the user code. So this is our first example of what code will look like um, between Fortran and C++. And I'm subtly using colors to make you think Fortran is bad with red and C++ is good with green. So super subtle there. Um, maybe I'll be able to convince you. But in Fortran, we define these arrays as reals. In C++, we just use real 4D because we have to know the dimensionality. And we just mention the name of it for debugging. And then you have the array sizes, which is exactly the same. Instead of ACC parallel loop collapse with a set of loops, we use the parallel four launcher with the bounds class. This is how many dimensions we have in the do loops that are tightly nested, the dimensions of them in order, and the uh, lambda syntax to get the array bounds. And here we just have an example of taking the, the flux divergence to update the tendency for a finite volume method. So the syntax is a little strange, but if you comment out the do loops above, it helps the, the developer know exactly what this parallel four is doing. The um, arrays can behave just like Fortran assumed shape arrays that carry the metadata with them. So if you just pass a real 3D of some variable that you wanted to transpose, for instance, and you can actually get the size of the dimensions using the size intrinsic, just like you do in Fortran. Makes it a little bit easier. And here in C++, we just define a local array, then we return that array. So you can return arrays just like you can in Fortran. It behaves very similarly. Um, of course, in practice, you would want to tile this loop for performance because it's full transpose of the data. If you want to do a reduction, in Fortran, this is like a shallow water model where if you want to do a, a reduction of the time step, for instance, calculating the maximum stable time step, you do a parallel loop collapse over the degrees of freedom you have, nx and ny, and you would just declare a reduction, a min reduction of the dt variable. So that's what OpenACC would look like. If we wanted this in C++, we would do something very similar, but we're just going to store the intermediate result of the maximum stable time step at each cell into an intermediate array and then just take the sum. Oh, that shouldn't be sum, that should be min. So there's a nice uh, typo in this slide. I'll have to fix that before I post it, but 
this would be a, a min of the dt array. So calculate um, the minimum time step. The sum of dt would definitely give you an unstable simulation. But it's a pretty easy syntax. I feel like this is about as readable as you can make performance portable C++. Atomics happen when multiple um, threads have to write to the same memory location at the same time. This typically happens when you have a partial reduction. So a reduction not over all the dimensions of an array, but over partial. So if we wanted to calculate the column average of a variable, for instance, you would just sum it up um, for each of the horizontal indices of that column and then divide it out by the uh, number of columns. You'd have this atomic update that you see here. In C++, uh, the, again, the loops are looking a little bit different here, but you would use this atomic add function. One of the benefits of C++ is you can calculate a complex expression on the right-hand side um, in situ, whereas in OpenACC, you have to assign it to a temporary variable so that the OMP, uh, so the ACC update uh, looks just like a simple addition to a scalar. So you don't have to do that in C++, but you do in OpenACC. There's also something called a scalar liveout. This is probably the sneakiest situation that comes up in a code um, that you have to handle on the GPU. Um, if you ever write to a scalar in a device kernel that you need to read outside that kernel, this is called scalar liveout. This is most common in error checking routines where you have some logical variable and you want to know if the data is bad, say the density is negative or something. So here's a Fortran and a C++ portability example, where if the density is less than zero at any point, then you would say the data is bad. And then if the data is bad, you put some error message and kill the simulation, or you just move it to some epsilon above zero, whatever you want to do. So this is the OpenACC version in C++ portability. We have the scalar liveout class that we would put of type bool which is the same as a Fortran logical, and you can initialize it to false. And this will handle the data traffic to the device for you. And when you're in the kernel, you just assign it as if it's a normal scalar. And again, there's a typo here. There should be a semicolon here, the most common typo in C++. But in this case, you just assign it like a normal scalar. And when you want to read it on the host, you would just say host read. And it'll handle everything behind the scenes for you for the scalar live out. If you try to do this with the normal scalar, CUDA will give a run uh, compile time error. I don't know what HIP would do. I don't think I've tried to get that error. So Yakul also has a pool allocator, um, which I affectionately call the pool alligator, which is a speech to text error that happened over and over again when I tried to say the word into my phone. So we made a nice little ASCII art of an alligator in a pool with a nice little catchy phrase. But what this does is it allows cheap frequent allocations. Most weather models um, and climate models, we like to allocate data when we need it. So you have a lot of frequent allocations, you use the data, then you deallocate it, and then you, know, you go back to the parent routine. So what this means is that if you have like allocations and then you call a function, you have more allocations, call a function, allocations, and then you deallocate in each of those routines, which is typically what we do, the allocations and deallocations, the pattern is a lot like a stack. So this pool allocator was optimized for that sort of pattern. Um, so there's little to no segmentation or wasted memory in this pool allocator, only if it's a stack-like um, pattern. If it's not, if it's a random allocation pattern, this pool allocator will not perform well, but it performs optimally if it's stack-like. It has Fortran hooks up to seven dimensional arrays. You can do CUDA and HIP managed memory. And there's automated hooks into OpenACC and OpenMP that tell the runtimes to leave that data alone so that the HIP and CUDA runtimes handle it instead. Because in my experience, the OpenACC and OpenMP runtimes of data management is where most of the bugs end up. So if you just tell it to leave everything alone and have the underlying CUDA and HIP libraries move the data for you, typically you get a more robust port even in Fortran. It's controllable by environment variables that define the size of the initial allocation and how much the pool grows by every time it needs to grow. And it does automatically grow as needed. So here's a list of some of the codes that have been developed with Yakul. Um, we have the SAM++ code that Isaac mentioned earlier. And if we ramp up the workload enough, we can get up to a 15x speed up. And again, you typically have to ramp up the workload to maximize the, the memory bandwidth. And this is comparing the optimal case of two power nines versus six volts. 
And we have done our best to make the Fortran code as competitive as possible on the CPU. So we're using the PGI compiler with Dash 03 on 84 tasks per node, comparing against the six volts. The, the PGI Fortran with 03 was the fastest we could get um, for the Fortran code. And I'm a big believer that your baseline needs to be as competitive as possible or your speed up number is pretty much meaningless. This uses the C++ style of Yakult and it was an incremental port from Fortran. The RRTMGP++ code, it's a lot to say. It's rapid radiative transfer model for GCMs in parallel. And this was ported to C++ using the Fortran style of Yakult, and this was also an incremental port under ECP funding. This one had 20 to 30 X speed up, and I think the only reason for this is because there must be a lot of transcendental functions called inside the code that maybe the GPU is handling better than Fortran. I did use fast math on the GPU, and I used dash 03 on the CPU. I'm hoping that turns on fast math, but if there's a way to make the CPU more competitive, I'm always uh, down for that because I want to make sure the comparison is appropriate. The uh, Triton Flood inundation code is this pretty simple shallow water code with Manning's roughness and bottom topography developed by Mario Morales at ORNL under the NCCS Air Force collaboration. And this uses the C++ style of Yakult. It's developed from scratch. I don't know what the speed up numbers are for that or the mini weather application. Even though I developed mini weather as a training application, I don't think I've done speed up estimates on Summit. But it also uses the C++ style of YAKL, along with a ton of other things, Fortran NC with OpenMC, OpenACC, OpenMP offload, OpenMP CPU, and MPI. There's also um, an ADER we know finite volume code at high order that I affectionately call AWFUL. You can see the letters I chose here. Um, this is a cloud resolving model dynamical core we're going to use for our multi-scale model and framework simulations. Um, this is developed by a lot of people. Um, Kyle is helping with the moisture and the subgrid scale. Um, Cresswell, he's at PNNL. Chris Eldred at Sandy is helping with the formulation. He's, he's uh, very gifted in numerical methods developments. And I'm kind of working on the HPC side and the high order and we know limited aspects of the dynamical core. This uses the C style of Yakult. It is also developed from scratch. And the uh, most expensive kernels, they've been designed to run well. I think I presented this last year at multi-core, but we get about 80% peak flops in single precision on the Volta if we have enough workload. It's uh, the only kernel I think I've ever developed or seen that actually achieves this. It's not just simple dense linear algebra. And the reason is we take a simple, we take a stencil of data in and we do high order reconstruction, which requires a lot of floating point operations. And then we do Wino limiting which requires a whole lot more floating point operations, but we don't need more data from DRAM. So you read a bit of data in, you do a ton of operations on it, then you put the data back. And by doing that sort of uh, motif computationally, we were able to actually saturate, get close to saturating the actual compute throughput of the GPU. And we were pretty excited about that. Keep in mind, this is just one kernel of the model, so this is not representative of the entire model, but it was exciting to see a result like this, at least for a kernel. So regarding future plans, uh, Yakko currently works on the CPU <clears throat> for serial loops. It works on NVIDIA GPUs and it works on AMD GPUs. I don't think I can give computational results for AMD GPUs, but it is good performance. And I've given computational results on NVIDIA so far. And it achieves the expected performance on GPUs. You, you kind of want to make sure you at least saturate memory bandwidth. And if you can get anything beyond that, that's great. It is 20% slower than the best case Fortran code on CPUs for most cases. It's unclear to me why this is. It could be because the Fortran compiler can optimize out a lot of the integer arithmetic and some of the array metadata when it comes to the actual um, kernels with a subroutine code. Um, it could be because of vectorization. It could be I don't know how to do uh, flags properly in C++ um, when it comes to GNU. It's unclear why this is, but that is one of the downsides uh, to running in C++ with our code at the moment. It's unclear if Cocos will do better. Hopefully we can get information on that soon and uh, end up with a code that uses C++ portability and performs well on CPUs. But the, as I mentioned earlier, the C++ compiler just has less information about vectorization. 
We're going to add an Intel GPU back in soon. There are two options, OpenMP Offload and Sickle. You can see here some of the things that we need. Um, in each of those, ne neither of them are able to handle our workloads in Yakul yet, but they are close. And we need a lot more testing. Currently, the tests are just via the applications that use Yakul, use a machine precision test against the Fortran codes or other sort of tests. And if you want to look at the other plans we have, you can take a look at the issues page on the Yakul GitHub repo. Um, I think I'm probably running out of time. Readability is extremely important. These are my kind of criterion of what makes the code readable. And I think you can do this in C++, even though a lot of people don't. So take a look at this slide. I think it's really important that we all pay attention to readable code. Uh, readability is paramount to um, productivity, in my opinion. So here's some further resources. These slides will be made available later once I fix some of the typos in the C++ code. You can follow these links um, to other articles that I've tried to create to, to make this stuff more clear and some of the other frameworks that are a little more capable than the afterwards. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, so will Yakul work with a variety of different compilers? I have tried with Intel, PGI, GNU, and Excel, and they all work with Yakul, not the Fortran. So XLF will not work because it's a C++ compiler, but XLC, I think underscore R you have to use because of the parallel threading, but yeah, it works with all of those. Um, what is the advantage of portable C++ over playing Cocos? Um, Cocos is portable C++. Um, I'm on the second question now, by the way. Um, when I'm presenting this, you should apply the lessons that I'm talking about to all of the frameworks. Cocos, Raja, C++, is it C++? Cocos, Raja, Sickle, and Yakul. Um, Yakul is a stopgap. I'm hoping that it doesn't need to exist in the future for our codes, and, and I don't think it will. We're pretty close to being able to merge with Cocos. So there's no advantage. Uh, the Cocos is portable C++. These are all under the umbrella of that. Um, moving to the next question. In Yakul's multi-dimensional arrays, is contiguity of successive indices guaranteed? Fortran does not guarantee it without the contiguous attribute. So another plus for C++. Yes, everything is contiguous in Yakul. That is not necessarily true for Cocos, although I think for GPU and CPU, for the simple things they do, if you don't do the tiled layouts or anything like that, it's still contiguous in Cocos as well. And there's this is contiguous uh, member function or something that'll return a true false, it'll tell you. So yeah, they're always contiguous at all times. It makes it easy to interact with uh, libraries because you know exactly what you're sending the library and how many elements, for instance, for MPI. Um, Fortran will do it for allocatables, but as you mentioned, uh, for pointers, you have to have the contiguous attribute, and I'm still not guarantee. I'm not sure that they guarantee that it's that way for pointers, but we'll have to see. Next question: um, Do I see any lag between the availability of C and C++ compilers on new hardware? The real key question here is: What attributes of C++ do you actually want? So, when it comes to C++ 11. I would say absolutely, um, that is pretty much available day one, as long as you're not using standard colon colon um, too much in your kernels. So if you're trying to use a standard vector or a standard array, it may or may not work on, in the device memory space because these have constructors that have to be run on the device. And it makes things a little complicated. When you look at these multi-dimensional array classes for Yakul and Cocos and Sickle, they have shallow copy semantics and they're, they're, they're developed very carefully to ensure that when you copy it to the device, the pointer is already on the device and you're just copying the metadata by value. Um, that's not necessarily true for anything in the standard template library. So yes, the, the, the C++ features we need for portable code is available typically immediately on new hardware. But if you want to pass like a, the, a class by value, that's available in CUDA now, but who knows if that's going to be available in the other portability languages. So I would steer clear of the more modern features of C++. Is kernel abstraction sufficient for performance portability? Do we need abstraction for kernel fusion as well? 
Uh, so here's a key point. There is no such thing as performance portability in the most absolute sense. You're giving up some performance when it comes to something like this. These, these libraries cannot perform kernel fusion for you unless you create an abstraction for that. And now the user code is getting kind of complicated in that case, because if, if you wanted the kernel fused, then maybe you should just have fused it to begin with. But if you want an abstraction for it, then theoretically, one architecture would do better without it, one architecture would do better with it. For instance, you would kill vectorization potentially with part of the code. You don't want to fuse that in, in the CPU. But you don't want to have more kernel launch overheads on the GPU, so you would want to fuse it. At that point, the user level code is getting kind of complicated. That worries me for readability. But it would be interesting to see a C++ framework create an abstraction for that. I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm not sure I would use it personally, but I think it's a very useful thing to have. So thanks for all the questions, and I'll turn it back over.